So we're going to begin now in uh, Revelation chapter 17. And uh, we'll just go ahead and get started then. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come and I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute who is seated on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth, and there's that idea of, uh, you know, a universal thing here, kings of the earth, have committed sexual immorality, and with the wine of those whose sexual immorality the dwellers on earth have become drunk. Now, I don't know if you remember, I think it was last week, we talked about how this sexual immorality is probably talking more of a, like a religious focus, and maybe this um, prostitute had, had uh, some idea of being a, uh, a false religion, and we showed some scriptures about how the, you know, the children of Israel would go after false gods, and the Lord talked about that being like idolatry and, and adultery. And even in James, it talks about how friendship with the world is adultery. You know, it's uh, you adulterers and adulteresses. Don't you know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? And so there's this idea that we've been espoused unto Christ as a chaste virgin, and if we go after other gods, we're, we're committing this, uh, you know, spiritual adultery. So here in this chapter, um, it's, it was kind of interesting to me that this angel pulled him aside to show him this judgment of the great prostitute. Um, the kings of the earth, like I mentioned before, it seemed to have a worldwide reach, this, uh, this judgment, this wrath of God, and, and it talks about the kings of the earth. Revelation 16, uh, we read that just a moment ago. So I won't take time, but remember those frogs, like those unclean spirits, like the frogs came out of the, the beast and the false prophet and uh, the dragon. And uh, it says they went abroad to the kings of the whole world to bring them to the great day of the battle. We also saw in chapter 14, uh, last week, I believe it was, that the Lord was doing many things on a worldwide basis as we, you know, as, we're, as all this stuff was kind of coming to a head. One was in Revelation 14, there was the angel flying overhead with the eternal gospel. And, and he was proclaiming to every nation, every tribe, every language and people. So that was a worldwide thing that was happening. And then in Revelation 14, 8, it talked about the Babylon, fallen, fallen is Babylon, the great... She made all the nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. So that was also kind of a worldwide uh, event, a focus. And then Revelation 14, 15, another angel came and out of the temple calling with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, put in your sickle and reap for the hour to reap has come for the harvest of the earth is fully ripe. So you see it's, a, it's a worldwide that's happening. You know, a lot of times in the world today, you'll hear of revivals. There's a revival in China, a revival in India, a revival in South America, a revival in, you know, who knows where. But when we see these things happening, it's, it's happening around the world. It's, it's just an amazing day. The description of the great prostitute. He carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names. It had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and jewels and pearls holding in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the impurities of her sexual immorality. On her forehead was written a name in the mystery, a name of mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes and of the earth's abominations. How would you like to have that for a bio? You know, like on LinkedIn or something. <laughs> I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And there again, we see that, that picture of the, the persecution against God's people that was brought out as a part of the description of this woman. So let's talk about these descriptions. It says she, she was sitting on a scarlet beast. You know, that to me is like she's full of sin. I mean, it's sin. Uh, we talked about this uh, in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. The beast was full of blasphemous names. Those are 
The, that, that word just means evil speaking primarily against God. You know, um, it seems odd to me, and, and you guys have probably heard this and have seen it, and maybe experienced it, that we use the names of God for curse words, but we never use like other gods. We don't, we don't curse Buddha. You know, we don't curse using Muhammad's name. You know what I mean? We, we always curse using Jesus Christ or, you know, God. You know, God. But you don't wonder why that is. Well, it's, it's probably the influence of this, this, this Babylon, this, this woman who has these tentacles seemingly in the world today. And, it, and it's odd to me that of all the religions that are out there, I mean, how many, how many gods are there in Hinduism? You know, like 30 million gods, they say. Is that what Jacob says, Todd? 30 million gods over there? I don't know what there is. Do you ever hear any of them blasphemed? <coughs> oh, Krishna. You know, whoever says, whoever says that, you know what I mean? There might be somebody, I don't know. But by and large, we hear the name of Jesus Christ in a curse, cursing way, the name of God in a cursing way. It's, it's all about this stuff here. The beast had seven heads and ten horns. Uh, it speaks of authority, possibly governmental type things. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet, maybe royalty. The woman was adorned with gold, jewels, and pearls, maybe wealth or economy. The description of her sins. A woman was holding a cup full of abominations and the impurities of her sexual immorality. She had on her name, uh, her forehead, a name called Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes. How would you like to be known as that? You know, you like, like to be known as a mom of good kids. She was known as the mother of prostitutes and of the earth's abominations. She was drunk with the blood of the saints. Just basically reiterating what we just read there. So what is this Babylon? You know, I think, and again, it's just an opinion. I think that we can see in the judgment of this prostitute that the Lord's judgment is really against all the systems of mankind, you know. I mean, it is a religious system, I, I think, in Revelation 14, when it talks about her making all the nations drink the passion of her sexual immorality. And like we talked about how being drawn after other gods is like adultery. So to me, that's a religious system. I think it's a governmental system. You see in Revelation 17, it says, uh, the angel said to me, the waters you saw where the prostitute is seated are peoples and multitudes and nations and languages. The ten horns you saw, they are the beast. They and the beast will hate the prostitute. They will make her desolate and naked and devour her flesh and burn her up with fire. For God has put into their hearts to carry out his purpose by being of one mind and handing over their royal power to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. And the woman that you saw is the great city that has dominion over the kings of the earth. And so that, to me, sounds more governmental, you know, uh, governments, nations. And the next thing here sounds to me like it's economic. Revelation 18, verse 2, he called out with a mighty voice, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She's become a dwelling place for demons, a haunt for every unclean spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a hunt for every unclean and detestable beast. For all nations have drunk the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality, and the kings of the earth have committed immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth have grown rich from the power of her luxurious living. So while we see there, obviously, unclean spirits, you know, that's a spiritual thing. We see the uh, religious thing there with the uh, sexual immorality. There's also this idea of the merchants, you know, growing rich with the luxuries that she had to provide. So, uh, again, as you think about this Babylon falling, you know, maybe what it's really saying is that God is bringing judgment to all the systems of the world. You know, we, 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 we as people try to find the answers to the world's problems in these very things. You know, is it religion? Is it government? Is it wealth? Is it something else? And all of these things will ultimately crumble because they deny our Lord and Savior, Jesus. The mystery of the woman. When I saw her, I marveled greatly. But the angel said to me, why do you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman 
and of the beast with seven heads and ten horns that carries her. The beast that you saw was and is not and is about to rise from the bottomless pit and go to destruction. And the dwellers on earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world will marvel to see the beast because it was and is not and is to come. Well, it says here that he was, he is not, he's about to rise from the bottomless pit. We saw that also in Revelation 11 when the beast came from the bottomless pit to make war against the two prophets who were prophesying in the, in the city of Jerusalem during that time. I want to talk for a few moments about the book of life on the next page. You know, it, it mentioned there in that scripture that all the dwellers on the earth whose names have not been written in the book of, the life, book of life from the foundation of the world will marvel to see the beast. What is the book of life? You know, it's the book whose names, when, when people are, are saved, when they come to know Jesus Christ, their name is written in that book. And um, it seems to indicate here that these names have been written since the beginning of the world. What's that about? I mean, how does, how does God even know, you know, that someone's name should be there? And we'll talk about that a little bit later on here in a moment. It says, those whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world will marvel to see the beast because it was and is not and is to come. In a sense, it seems like the people who didn't know the Lord, whose names were not written in that book, are easily deceived. They marvel at this. It's like, wow, I got to follow after this thing. But here's some other scriptures about the book of life. Philippians 4.3 says, yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow's workers whose names are in the book of life. You know, the thing I like about that is, you know, when you read in the book of Revelation and most of the scriptures in the Bible about the book of life are in Revelation, not all of them, but many of them are. Sometimes people might think of it as a, a symbolic thing or, a, you know, just a, 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 you know, a, an expression to, to say something, a deeper meaning or a different kind of meaning. But I like the idea that the Apostle Paul also believed in the book of life. And he mentioned, hey, there's some people here, and I just want you to know their names are in the book of life. And uh, it's not a fairy tale. It's not a fanciful thing. It's not just a, uh, a, a fanciful word to describe something else. There is a book. One day the Bible says the books will be open and another book, which is the book of life. And whoever's name is not written in the book of life will be judged from the books. And you don't want to be there. You want to be over here. And so uh, I would like to be able to look out here and say, Todd, whose name is in the book of life. And Robin, whose name is in the book of life. I mean, wouldn't that be great? I mean, all that is there. It's like if there's any place you want your name, you know, it wouldn't be the Alliance Review. Because they're going to misspell it more than likely. It, you want to have it in the book of life. Revelation 3, verse 5. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. Well, that seems to me that maybe it's possible to have your name blotted out. He said, these people here who conquer, I'm never going to blot their name out. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Revelation 13, 7. Also, it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them, Authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation and all who dwell on the earth will worship it. This is the beast. Everyone whose name was not written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the lamb who was slain. Revelation 20, verse 12. I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and the books were open. And then another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. And then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. Anyone's name, if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. So that book becomes the 
kind of the, 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 at, the judgment, at the judgment seat, that book becomes the most critical piece of information for, for every human being. You're either in that book or you're not. And if you're in the book, eternal life. If you're not, the lake of fire. Revelation 21, by its light will all the nations walk. The kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Its gates will never be shut by day. There will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. So there is this book of life written from the foundation of the world. How is it that God even knows? You know, how is it that God knows whose name should be there? I mean, I, I kind of read here that, it, that my name was written in there before the foundation of the world. Before the foundation of the world. So it wasn't like it was a blank book and then at some point on the day I got saved, he decided to write it in there. It was written in ahead of time. And, um, you know, I want to share, I guess, at the end of this, a little bit about the idea of... Uh, predestination and the free will of man and kind of how all those things work together. But the idea is that for God to know something doesn't necessarily mean he makes it happen. You know, here's an example. I, I know tomorrow the sun's going to come up. How many know that? We know that just because, I mean, we, we've lived long enough to realize that's the way it works. That's called foreknowledge. I know ahead of time. But my knowing it doesn't make it happen. It's going to happen. I just know it. God is one who has all knowledge. He knows everything in the past, everything in the present, and he knows the future. There's actually a, a theology that's out there today that, that says that God is not really sure what's going to happen in the future because it's, it's, it's dependent upon what, what men decide to do. Well, God knows, and yet somehow, somehow in his wisdom, he's made it possible that men can still act even though he knows and, and, and even, even though he has a purpose. And I want to try to show you that in, in these scriptures here near the end. But when I think about this idea of my name being written in the book of life from before the foundation of the world, it's because he knew me before the foundation of the world. Think of how awesome that is. I mean, before the world was ever made, he says, Bob Gruy, I'm writing your name in the book of life. You know, I mean, to me, that is, that is so awesome. Before the foundation of the world, Jesus was as a lamb slain. What's that say to you? That says that God knew that man would fall. He knew that he would create man, that man would fall, and yet he planned ahead of time for that. He didn't make it happen, but he knew it would happen. And so Jesus was as a lamb slain from before the foundation of the world. Before Adam ever took a breath, Jesus said, I'll die. I'll take their place. And to me, that, that is just so, so wonderful to even sit and try to contemplate that, that in the heart of God was this desire to have, a, have he didn't need anything. He doesn't need us, but he, he wants us. He wants to have this relationship. Adam, Adam, where are you? He wants to have a fellowship with us. And yet knowing all the misery that our lives would bring in terms of the wrath of God and the judgment. And like it says in the book of Genesis, when he brought the flood, he said it repented God that he even made man. I mean, it, it came to that point where he's like, man, you know, what's going on here, you know? But he knew it would happen. And still with all that, he was willing to come and die in our place to make it possible that everyone who will be, his name would be written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. So Matthew 25, 13, here's some other things that happen at the foundation of the world. The king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. You know, the kingdom of heaven wasn't an afterthought. And it wasn't like, 
now God's going to do this. That was from the beginning of the world, from the foundation of the world, kingdom of heaven. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you've given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. You know, there was this relationship in the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit of love before the, before the foundation of the world. Aren't you glad of that? And again, it's not like God needed anything. He chose to be this sacrificed lamb so that they could include others. Jesus said, where I am, you may be also. Father, let them be one as we are one, that they may share in the same thing. Our fellowship is with the Father. Our fellowship is with one another. I mean, God desires to have this communion with, with people. And uh, from the foundation of the world, he made that choice. Ephesians 1, 4, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. See here, it's not saying that we were chosen before the foundation of the world. It's not like God predestined us, but the choice was that once we were receiving Christ, we would be holy and blameless. Hebrews 4.3, We who have believed enter that rest, as he has said, As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. Think about that. The works of God were finished from the foundation of the world. 1 Peter 1.20 He was foreknown. This is speaking about Jesus Christ when he came in the flesh. Is that he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in these last times for the sake of you. In other words, God was never into plan B. You know, the cross was not plan B. The church was not plan B. The kingdom of heaven was not plan B. None of this was plan B. From the foundation of the world, it's always been his plan. Revelation 13 a, all who dwell on the earth will worship it. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of the life of the lamb who was slain. And then in Revelation 17 8, I read that earlier. So let's go now to the next verse in, in uh, the book of Revelation. This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman is seated. They are also seven kings, five of whom have fallen. One is, the other has not yet come. And when he does come, he must remain only a little while. As for the beast that was and is not, it is an eighth, but it belongs to the seven, and it goes to destruction. I have to be honest with you, I don't really understand all that. <laughs> the ten horns that you saw are ten kings who have not yet received royal power, but they are to receive authority as kings for one hour together with the beast. These are of one mind, and they hand over their power and authority to the beast. I mean, they, they say that these seven heads can represent seven mountains or seven kings, and, you know, historically... It says five were fallen, one is, the other is yet to come. There's a, there's a sample of what that might even be. Egypt, Babylon, Assyria, Medio persia Greece. These, these also kind of line up with uh, the, the, the book of Daniel and how he was seeing the, the, uh, the statue there. One is, existing at that time of this writing, which was Rome, the other is yet to come, which uh, is going to be around for a little while. To me, that's... This last kingdom of the Antichrist, three and a half years, the last three and a half years before the Lord returns. As for the beast that was and is not, it is an eighth, but it belongs to the seven. Probably just means that the same Antichrist spirit that was in these nations will be kind of in a conglomeration within the Antichrist. They will make war with the Lamb and the Lamb will conquer them. There should never be any doubt in any of our minds who's going to win this battle in the end. You know, these, these frogs are going out to deceive the kings of the earth to gather them together to this battle, and it says they will make war on the Lamb, but it's, it's futile. How can we ever fight against God? How can we ever fight and win the battle against Jesus? Can you imagine, even if they pulled out every atomic weapon they had and fired at the Lamb of God, what would happen? Nothing. 
You, you can't win a battle against our Lord Jesus Christ. And so they will make war on the Lamb. The Lamb will conquer them, for He is Lord of lords and King of kings. And those with Him are called and chosen and faithful. Let's talk about called, chosen, and faithful for a little bit. Those with Him are called, chosen, and faithful. Well, we've been called, called to an eternal glory. There's a lot of scriptures in the Bible about being called, and uh, I'm focusing here on these two, uh, our, our calling to be with Him forever, eternal life. We're called to an eternal glory. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who has called us to His own glory and excellence. What a calling. You know, if you ever wonder, people will walk around saying, I wonder what my calling is in God. Well, this is one for sure. You've been called to his own glory and excellence. And that's something you'll experience in the future, for sure. 1 Peter 5, 10. After you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ. I don't know what that even looks like, but I know that Jesus said, Father... Give me the glory that I had with you before the world was created. Before he was ready to go to the cross, he said, Father, give me the glory again that I had with you then. There was something about the glory of God that Jesus lived in, experienced. He laid it aside to come to the earth as a man. And before he was crucified, he was longing for that moment again. Something about the eternal glory of Christ he himself will restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. We're called now. Yeah, there's something for the future. There's something in heaven. But there's also a calling for here and now. He says, as he who has called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. So we're called to a certain life, a holy life, to live you know, right before the Lord. That's a calling. You may not know if you're called to be a preacher or an evangelist or a missionary or, you know, a, a mom or a Sunday school teacher. You may not really understand all that in time, but you should know you're called to be holy. You know, there are certain things that are just nailed down in the Bible that should leave none of us in confusion about our calling. And my guess is if we start pursuing the things that we know we're called to, the other of that stuff will just follow along. 2 Timothy 1 verse 9 it talks about him who saved us and he called us to a holy calling. Called to be holy. Not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ before the ages began. And then finally in 1 Timothy, fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you are called, or which you were called. Take hold of it. Don't let go of it. Fight the fight about which you have made a good confession in the presence of many witnesses. You know, it's easy to give up the fight. Why not fight for something that God's called you to? Why not fight to hang in there? You know, don't give up on your faith in the Lord. Don't, don't let the, the, the struggles of this life destroy your faith. Hang in there. Fight the good fight. As I said before, if you, be, if you feel like you're becoming weak, you feel like your heart is becoming hardened, Come back and be re-energized. Get, get some brothers around you who can encourage you, who can pray for you. Say, hey, this fight is worth it. We have, we have been called to receive the eternal glory of Christ. We've been called to a great place. And we've been called to live a holy life. What a calling we have. Don't lay it aside. Well, what about chosen? Well, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. And he sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. There is a calling, and sometimes we just don't come. Come, there's a call, come. And they would not come. He sent other servants saying, tell those who are invited, see, I prepared my dinner. My ox and my fat calves have been slaughtered. Everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. You know, and, and that's, that's also similar to what can happen to us today, isn't it? That, that there's a call that goes, and yet we have, and again, we have to live our life. We have grass to cut. We have 
food to shop for. I understand all that. But, but why would we allow the, the, uh, the affairs of this life to crowd out the calling of God and his purpose for our life? I don't have time. Got a farm, got a business, you know, lay it aside. And the king was angry. And he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. And then he said to his servants, the wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Why weren't they worthy? They chose not to be. They were called, they were invited, but they had other things. So called and chosen, to me, chosen somewhat rests with me. I can be called, but do I choose to be chosen? The invitation was there. The door was open. The wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the roads. They gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. And when a king came in to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. Remember we talked about in the last chapter, make sure you're not naked. And he saw a man there who had no wedding garment, and he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. And the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot, and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then Jesus says, For many are called, but few are chosen. You know, so, that, so he uses this story to explain the idea, Many are called, few are chosen. And you can see that those chosen are those who chose to be chosen. Those who allowed themselves to come in. Those who were prepared. Those who had the garment. Those who responded to the invitation. Many are called. Few are chosen. So those who came with Jesus were called and chosen. Called and chosen. And finally, they were faithful. Called, chosen, and faithful. Revelation 2.10, do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. And for 10 days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death. In other words, don't give up. Hang in there. Be faithful, even if it means that you would die in, in the case of this particular church. Don't give up on the thing that God has done in your life. I mean, he was actually talking here about people ready to experience martyrdom. And he says, be faithful unto death. I will give you the crown of life. See, it's not over when it's over here. If all you see is what's here, you'll miss this eternal perspective that can help you walk through life in victory. I mean, Jesus was telling these guys, listen, you're going to undergo a hard time. There will be some testing. You will have 10 days of tribulation, but be faithful. Don't give up. Don't give in, because I will give you the crown of life. Even if you die, it's a crown of life unto you. Revelation 2.13, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, yet you hold fast my name, and you did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. He's speaking to the same church, and he talks about Antipas. I read in the, it's not in the Bible, but it's in a, in a history book, that this guy Antipas was martyred. They had like a, uh, a bronze cow, some sort of an idol, that they opened it up, stuck him inside of it, and put fire underneath it. Basically burned him alive inside there. You know how that metal would just heat up. That's what the history books say about how this man died. And Jesus said he was a faithful martyr. Even in the most duress of times in his life, the greatest persecution, he did not give up on his faith in the Lord. And Jesus gave him a crown of life. But, you know, here we are in 2018. We give up serving God because we get a flat tire. You know what I mean? It's like, comparatively speaking, what are we suffering here? And yet we, we lose our faith. We, we give up on our faithfulness. For, for things that don't even count. And, and here, these, these words in, in this book of Revelation were being spoken to these seven churches that were, many of them, undergoing huge persecution. 
And Jesus is trying to lift up their eyes saying, hey, look, I want you to know that in the end, this is all going to work out and we're going to win and I'm going to come back and there will be wrath and you will have vengeance. Everything will be taken care of, but don't give up. Hang in there. Don't give up on your faith. And those who came with him were called, they were chosen, and they were faithful. Faithful to the end. 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, what you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses and trust to faithful men. You know, one of the, one of the principles that we, we believe in our church is that we, we should be in this place of teaching men who can teach others or women, you know, faithful people. Teach them so they can pass it along. You know, we're not the last generation. If Jesus doesn't come back, some of us in this room are going to be dead. But there's going to be people here. What are, are we going to pass along what we know? Or are we going to just take it with us to the grave? Pass it on. Find a faithful man. Faithful. Somebody who will hold to it, who will believe it, and he will pass it on. You actually see four generations here. Paul said to Timothy, you, Timothy, things you've heard of me. So it's Paul, Timothy, commit to faithful men who will teach others also. So there's this idea that we take the things we've learned, we pass them down. You know, if you're involved in a ministry, teach others that are with you. The youth, find the new leaders. In the Sunday school, find the new leaders. On the worship team, find the new leaders. You know, you guys that are older men that have been around, find some of these younger guys. You know, there's young guys that are growing up and they don't know what it means to be a married man. You've been married for 20, 30 years and you have some wisdom. <laughs> or You've had something, let's call it experience. You've gone through things and you have things to impart. You have things to help with, you know. It doesn't have to always be uh, like a Bible study. It can be life. But you have something to give, every one of us. When I was first saved, our, the church where I got saved in up in Alaska was undergoing like a, like a mini revival. It was like near the end of the Jesus People movement. And it seemed like every week someone was getting saved. And it, it was such a hotbed of uh, spiritual discipleship. It's almost like, you know, you were, you were saved for two months. A, a new Christian comes in and uh, one of the elders would say, hey, you see that new Christian over there? Take him under your wing and help him. And you're like, I don't know anything. And he, and he would say, you know two months more than he does. So pass that along, and then you'll get something else, and you can pass that along. And there was just that, that idea that what we've learned is not just for ourselves. It's for others. Pass it on. So I hope that um, in our church, uh, even this, this spirit of discipleship and you know, putting the word out will grow and increase more and more. I know it happens in pockets here and there, but it, it needs to be really uh, just a philosophy of ministry for us. We've all been given something. We all have something to impart. Take somebody under your wing, you know, even if it's just one-on-one. -on -one. Take them out to lunch and, and impart some things. You have a lot to give. Luke nineteen seventeen. This is a story of the parable of the talents. And he says, uh, well done, good, and good servant, because you have been faithful. There's that word, faithful in a little. I will give you authority over 10 cities. And then this finally, uh, Luke 12. Stay dressed for action and keep your lamps burning. Be like the men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast. So these are parables. This one here is speaking about the last days again so that they may, be, they may open the door to him once he comes back and knocks. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. Remember that in the last chapter? Make sure you're awake. Blessed are those whom the master finds awake when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will dress himself for service and have them recline at the table, and he will come and serve them. If he comes in the second watch or the third and finds them awake, blessed are those servants. But know this, that if the master of the house had known it, what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let this house to be broken into. You also must be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. And Peter said, Lord, are you telling this parable for us or for all? And the Lord said, who is the faithful and wise manager whom his master will set over his household to give them their portion of food at the proper time? 
And he spoke about a man who is faithful and wise. That's who this parable is written to, those who are faithful. So I encourage you. We've all, we've all been called. We all have a calling. Choose to be chosen. Respond. Respond to the call of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not just your initial salvation, but the Lord continues to call us. And maybe, he's called, maybe he calls you to a closer walk. Maybe he calls you into a ministry. Maybe he calls you to sacrifice your life and be a missionary. I don't know what, he, what his call is for you. But if it's his call, respond to it. Call, chosen, and then be faithful. Take, take whatever it is the Lord's given you and be faithful to the end. You know, whether you're called to be a martyr for Christ, and there are thousands of them in the world today. Don't, don't think it's that remote. There are thousands of people who are giving their lives for Jesus Christ. Or if he's just calling you to be faithful as a husband or faithful as a dad or a faithful disciple where you can take the things that God's given you and you pass them on to others. Just be faithful. Commitment is, a, I was just talking to a brother today about how it seems in our, in our world today, many of the young people fail to understand the value of commitment. It's almost like they're afraid to commit to something because a better offer might come. You know what I mean? And so they don't commit to anything. And everything is kind of spur of the moment. But every time you, you, you want to commit to something, you have to say no to something. You know, I, I told this guy, I said, if you commit to a marriage, you're saying no to every other woman. Do you realize that? That's a commitment that says no to everything else. And um, sometimes... I think that's a principle that, for whatever reason, is, is, is lost on many in this younger generation. So one thing that we can impart and teach is commitment. You know, help them to walk through that idea. And so an explanation here in verse 15, the angel said, The waters you saw where the prostitute is seated are people, multitudes, nations, and languages, the ten horns, they, are the beast, or, or, they and the beast hate the prostitute. They will make her desolate, naked, devour her flesh, and burn her up with fire. For God put it into their hearts to carry out his purpose. God put it into their hearts to carry out his purpose, being of one mind and handing over their royal power to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. I want to talk for just a moment about this uh, interaction between the sovereign God and the will of man. I mean, there's been, uh, you know, arguments about this. I mean, for centuries, obviously. Um, there's two, two opposite positions. And sometimes people think they're mutually exclusive. You know, God is either this or that. I see them being very complementary in the Bible. And I just want to share a couple of those with you. Uh, a couple of scriptures along that line, and we'll close. And, and I'm really pointing to this idea in verse 17. God has put it in their hearts to carry out his purpose until the words of God are fulfilled. So on the next page, at times, the sovereign Lord fulfills his purpose by using the will of man. In Acts 2, verse 23 Peter was preaching and he says, this man, speaking of Jesus, was handed over to you by what? God's purpose. Jesus died because of the purpose of God and the foreknowledge of God. And so he brings in, in into this, this message right here, God's purpose was involved, but he did it, look at this, with the help of wicked men. And so you see there both this this uh, sovereignty of God, my purpose is that my son would give his life. That's my purpose. And my purpose will be fulfilled. He did it with the help of wicked men. So there were people there who had a free will to choose to reject him and to crucify him. And so you see both the sovereignty of God and the free will of man kind of working in a complementary way there. They did this by uh, nailing him to the cross. Acts 4.27, indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire. So here you see people, human beings, having a conspiracy, meeting together against Jesus, whom you anointed. In verse 28, they did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. You see that again? You see the sovereignty of God. There was this, his will and his purpose was that Jesus should die 
And yet he used this conspiratorial heart that Herod and Pilate and the Gentiles and the people of Israel had to go against Jesus. So it's not like God made them do it, but he used their, already the tendencies of their heart. And somehow that free will of man resulted in the purpose of God being fulfilled. They're complementary. Acts 13, brothers, children of Abraham and you God-fearing Gentiles, it is to us this message of salvation has been sent. The people of Jerusalem and their rulers did not recognize Jesus. Yet, in condemning him, they fulfilled the words of the prophets that are read every Sabbath. Can you imagine that? Here's these guys every Sabbath day. They're sitting there. They're reading these scriptures. They don't even see it. They're, they're kind of blinded to the reality. And yet, by their condemning Jesus, they're fulfilling these very scriptures. Though they found no proper ground for a death sentence, they asked Pilate to have him executed. When they had carried out all that was written about him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in the tomb, but God raised him from the dead. And for many days he was seen by those who had traveled with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. They are now his witnesses to our people. We tell you the good news. What God has promised our fathers, he has fulfilled for us, their children, by raising up Jesus. As it is written in the second Psalm, you are my son today, I have become your father. I'm going to end it there. There's a few other scriptures here and, and on the next page. Uh, you can review those uh, on your own. I hope it becomes self-evident to you that uh, there is a, a complementary uh, aspect to the sovereign, sovereignty of God and the will of man. And so in that book of Revelation there where it says God has put it into their hearts to carry out his purpose, it was already their intention to do something evil. God uses that. God uses that for his purposes. It's, to me, it's amazing. It's a great mystery as to how it works. But God has a purpose. We know it's there. We know it will be fulfilled. Nothing can thwart his purpose. And yet, at the same time, he never infringes upon the free will of man. You know, that, that it's just a beautiful marriage of those concepts. It's not an either or. It's, it's kind of a both and. So I like that. I, and I rest in that in my own heart knowing that God has a purpose and knowing that somehow he's given me a free will. And one, one way or another, I'm, I'm going to end up stumbling into his plan. So I don't sit and worry about it. I just trust him that he has a purpose and a plan.